a history class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of 1920 to 45, and in this series of lectures, we're going to talk about a period in the early 20s that we might call nativism triumphant. This series of lectures will include the Red Scare, immigration restriction, discussion of the Klan, and a number of other factors in the early 1920s. You might factor all of these into a broader discussion of the question, were the 1920s really roaring? This idea of the roaring 20s as a fun-loving, freewheeling time. And without tipping my hand too much, I think it's fair to say that for many Americans, this era in our history was not roaring at all. The United States, which is sometimes known as a nation of immigrants, has an equally long history of a fear and hatred of immigrants and foreigners and an intense promotion of those who were born here in the United States. This idea, broadly speaking, is known as nativism, fear and hatred of immigrants. There have been a number of particularly powerful waves of nativism in American history. We might look at anti-Catholicism and anti-Irish uh, nativism spirit in the 1830s to 1850s as waves of Irish came during the potato famine. We might also look at anti-Asian uh, thought in the 1870s and 80s focused around the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The wave of nativist thought that we're going to be focusing on in these lectures marks the culmination of a rising anti-immigrant sentiment that was sparked in the 1880s and 90s as waves of what are often described as new immigrants poured into the United States. Some 26 million immigrants entered between the 1880s and 1920s, coming in largest numbers from Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, Italians, Polish, and Russian Jews, really the largest groups among them. And so this flood of immigrants sparked new anti-immigrant feelings. Many of the new arrivals, as just mentioned, were from Eastern Europe, Poland, Italy, etc. They weren't necessarily well educated, and many of them didn't speak English, so there was a language barrier there. There were also religious conflicts. Many of them were Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, or Jewish. And in many ways, they might have been slow to adopt American ways. They tended to identify more with their homelands than with the United States, at least in the short term. As mentioned, many of them didn't speak English uh, and or were slow to learn it after they arrived. And in many cases, they didn't vote or uh, just kind of dive into the American way of doing things. Uh, they clung to the culture of their homelands rather than uh, adapting quickly to American ways. There was a sweeping belief that the immigrants were more inclined to be criminals than those already living in the United States, although there's little evidence to prove that. And when we do see criminal activity, it's not out of proportion with those who were already in the States. And were due to many other factors, uh, along with just the fact that they were immigrants. There were also many who were drawn to radical political groups, and we're going to be talking uh, a bit more about uh, some of this when we talk about the Red Scare, but they might have been drawn to political movements that were popular back in Europe, such as socialism or communism. And there certainly were some who were drawn to even more radical political movements, such as anarchism. Finally, there were economic arguments against continuing to bring in immigrants in large numbers. This was a seemingly endless supply of cheap labor. Even some immigrant groups protested. Once they were here, they didn't want more to keep on coming because this wave of new immigrants created competition for jobs as they were willing to work for lower wages. These kind of feelings were compounded in times of economic trouble, such as during the depressions or panics of 1893 and 1897, uh, and really many people consider this just one prolonged 
depression or recession throughout the 1890s. And lurking behind these practical and rational explanations for nativism was simply racism. Racism against what were perceived to be inferior European peoples. One writer captured the spirit of the times in his poem, The Unguarded Gates. Wide open and unguarded stand our gates, and through them pass a wild motley throng, men from the Volga and the Tartar steppes, featureless figures from the Huang Ho, Malayan, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav, flying the old world's poverty and scorn. These bring with them unknown gods and rites, those tiger passions here to stretch their claws. In street and alley, what strange tongues are these? Accents of menace in our ear, voices that once the Tower of Babel knew. By the late 19th century, the top scientific minds believed that the Nordic race was superior and that only Anglo-Saxons could uphold a democracy. And the model that we see on this screen was commonly accepted in the early 1900s with Nordic races and European groups at the top and working their way down through Native American, African, and so on. Added to these factors was a bit of a panic accompanying the census of 1890 and the famous frontier thesis that the frontier was closing. There was no longer open space available for these new arrivals to move into. So now we had to make a decision, and this is a quote from the time, whether we wanted our country to be, quote, peopled by British, German, and Scandinavian stock, historically free, energetic, progressive, or by Slav, Latin, and Asiatic races, historically downtrodden, atavistic, and stagnant. With all of these things in mind, in 1894, a group of Harvard graduates formed the Immigration Restriction League. This was the most important pressure group to change and restrict immigration policy. It was headed by Henry Cabot Lodge, a representative from Massachusetts from 1887 until his death in 1924. This group's primary call was for a literacy test for incoming immigrants. The bill was brought up repeatedly until 1917. Several times it passed both houses of Congress only to be vetoed by three different presidents. Perhaps the most poignant veto came in 1915 from Woodrow Wilson, the famous educator whom we've already discussed, who said that immigrants came seeking opportunity and the bill would reject them unless they had already had one of the chief opportunities they sought, the opportunity of education. In 1917, Wilson vetoed the bill again, but this time it passed through Congress. All adult immigrants had to be literate. The bill could have been even more restrictive. In Australia, for instance, the examiner could pick the language that someone had to be literate in. In the United States, the immigrant could be literate in any language. And this literacy requirement had dubious effect on immigration itself. In all likelihood, it did deter some immigrants from even coming as they feared the exam itself and knew they might not be able to pass. But of those who did come, it proved to be a relatively small obstacle. In 1920 to 21, for instance, out of 800,000 immigrants admitted, only 1,400 were denied entrance on account of the literacy test. There were other barriers being raised as well, though, and increasingly there were limitations on a wide open door to immigrants. After the 1901 assassination of President William McKinley, for instance, which was done by a radical a political radical immigrant. All immigrants had to pass a political opinions test as of 1903, although this one seems to have had dubious effects as well. One can imagine immigrants arriving at Ellis Island or another entry point and being asked, are you a political anarchist? And of course, they would say, no, there's really no way to prove that. <laughs> 
As I mentioned in the previous lecture, in 1917, with the United States moving inexorably towards participation in World War I, the anti-immigrant sentiment that was already present in the country only swelled. So what were some of the factors that lead directly to the Red Scare? Well, as discussed in the previous lectures about World War I, one of them was the hyper-patriotism, or super-patriotism, drummed up by Creel's Committee on Public Information during World War I. After the war, these paranoid fears of communism in the country found a new target in the communists. Also, as previously described during World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and more importantly, the creation of the Communist Third International, which called for the spread of communism throughout the world, inspired fear and ultimately paranoia in the United States. This is going to come to be known as the Red Scare, which we'll discuss more fully in the next lecture. It's important to note that this fear of communism included all workers, most of which were made up of immigrants into the country. So fear of labor was accompanied with fear of communism, which was accompanied by fear of immigrants. So the super patriotism of these groups during World War I, combined with the turmoil of thousands of soldiers returning home to spark a number of incidents early in 1919. Jobs were increasingly scarce and labor strife was common. So the nation was ripe for the crisis that would come to be known as the Red Scare. We'll talk more about that Red Scare in the following lecture.